morning, church family. We're so happy you're here with us today, either in person or online. Here are a few announcements for today. Are you new to Geyer Springs and want to know more about our church? If so, join us for our next Discover class on February 20th at 445 in Sanders Hall. Guests and prospective new members can learn about church membership and hear about our mission and values. Child care is provided, but you will need to register at gsfbc.org slash discover by February 13th. One of our core values here at Geyer Springs is prayerful dependence. We pray to align our hearts and mind with God. Join us for a church-wide prayer service tonight at 530. Men and women will be divided and will pray together, women in the venue and men in Sanders Hall. A fellowship will follow in Sanders Hall at 630. Please bring a snack to share. Child care is provided from birth to third grade. Thank you for joining us today. We're so happy you're here and we look forward to worshiping with you. Yeah, it's so good to be here in the Lord's house this morning together to worship. Man, uh, we just want to give a special welcome right now as at the beginning of our service. If you're a guest this morning, we are so thankful that you are here with us today. Uh, if you are a guest, if you've got a phone or a smartphone and you want to just pull that out right this minute, we'd love for you to take that out. Text to 94000, just the word discover. It's a great way for us to connect with you, and we want to invest in you and love on your family. I see some people standing. Y'all are ready to go this morning. Uh, I'm not even going to finish the welcome thing. So Adam or Pastor Jason, if you guys need to, I mean, everybody's ready to go, man. So we're just going to do this. Let's stand to our feet this morning. Hey, do this for me. Uh, let's be respectful of our neighbor, okay? Unless you just know your neighbor and you know they're good with it. Let's do a little greet time. So if you wanna turn and give like an elbow bump or a wave, let's just uh, say hi to a few people around you. Maybe introduce yourself and uh, then we're gonna get going.
our hands together and sing. Come on. He is faithful. He sing it out. service to sing about the incredible uh, glory and majesty and faithfulness of our God. Um, as we continue to sing this morning, we're going to teach you guys uh, what for some of you may be a new song this morning. Uh, and uh, we sing a lot of incredible songs about uh, our God and truths about him. And as we just sang that he has faith and love and grace and mercy. And, and I love when we sing songs that what I like to call are just holistic gospel songs. Uh, that from the beginning to the end of the song, they just paint the picture, the incredible picture of the mercy, the grace, the love that our God has for us through his son, Jesus. And so this morning, we want to teach you a song that does just that. Um, and I think it's so important for us. You know, we've been, I've, I've been reading with some of my D group guys through Galatians. And uh, we've been looking at just even in the first chapter of Galatians, how there are a lot of false gospels. There are a lot of uh, truths out there that, that will lead our hearts and lead our minds astray and lead us away from what God's, God truly has for us. And so this morning as we sing this song, uh, it's, a, it's a true song about the glory of our God and how he reaches out to us through his son Jesus, defeats death and sin, and gives us an eternal relationship with him. So to start, we're just going to sing this first verse together. And I want to teach it to you and then hope you guys will join in with us. So it goes like this. Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. All right, let's sing. Is it? 
Christ the Lord upon the tree in the stead of ruined sinners hangs the Lamb in victory see the price of our redemption see the Father's plan unfold bringing many sons to glory grace unmeasured love untold Well, good morning. I'm so glad you're with us today. My name is Adam Miller. Uh, Last week, Dave announced me as the Connections Pastor for the venue service. And so I want to just take a few moments before we continue in worship and just explain a little bit more about what my role is going to be as we move forward in in really just our Sunday morning worship. Uh, As the Connections Pastor, I want to kind of break down what we do as the pastoral ministry team. Uh, Some of y'all may think we're just like the theological brains on subjects or we kind of lead worship together. Biblically, when we look at scripture and we look at what it means to be a pastor or a shepherd or an overseer, it comes back to one word, service, equipping, training. In fact, if you look at Ephesians chapter 4, Jesus is explaining how the the role of the church is going to play out. And he says he gives prophets, and he gives evangelists, and he gives shepherds and teachers, and he gives this one word. He, he says, here's what they're doing, and here's what they're for, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And so when we break that down a little bit more, my role moving forward is to equip the saints, who are the saints, those who are in Christ, who call themselves Christians, for the work, right? We learned last week from Dave's message that we are created on purpose and for a purpose, and that work is good, and that our work, when it's fulfilled for the purposes of God, it's great. And so when we think about equipping ourselves for the work of ministry, what we're doing is is we're signing up to do the will of the Father and really expand his kingdom. And so that's my job. I want to serve you, and I want to serve you well so that you can go and do the work wherever God has called you to do, whether it's in school or whether it's at Uh, you know, your workplace or whether you're going out to the movies or whether you're seeing somebody at Walmart, I want you to be fully equipped for the work of the ministry. And so in doing so, this is really cool. Uh, We're going to do this together. This is a place of worship that you have chosen to come on a Sunday morning. And we want to make sure that if you're here, you're shepherd well, you're taught well to be equipped. Before we do that, I I want to share something from John chapter 13. This is a beautiful picture of who Jesus is. Right before he's going to the cross, he's got one more lesson he's going to teach his disciples. Now, this is Jesus. If you don't know him, he's fully man, fully God. Philippians says that he humbles himself, taking the form of man. And as he's on earth, before he's going to the cross, he's going to teach his disciples this last lesson. 
And he tells them, he's like, hey, you call me teacher and you call me Lord. That's good. You're right. I'm going to show you what it means to have authority and influence and use it well. And he says this, when he had washed the disciples' feet and put on the outer garments and resumed his place, which is the place of honor, he said to them, do you understand what i just done? What he has just done? He had taken a basin of water and a cloth and he knelt down and he, he washes his disciples' feet. Some of y'all out there are like, man, feet are gross, feet are nasty. 2,000 years ago, it was even more gross, even more nasty. And so Jesus, again, who is King of Kings, who is Lord of Lords, decides that he's going to serve his disciples by washing their feet. Peter doesn't like it. If you remember the story, he's like, no, nah, you ain't washing my feet. We're not doing that. Like, I should be washing yours. And he, he tells them, hey, this is appropriate for a lesson and an example I'm going to give to you. Verse 13 out of John 13 says this, you call me teacher, you call me Lord, and you are right, for so am I. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is no greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than those who have sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I tell you that because here's what I want for you. I don't want anything from you. I want something for you. Our staff wants something for you, and here's what it is. The same thing that Jesus is teaching his disciples into servanthood, into ministry, is the same thing we want for you. We want you to use, if you're in Christ, the God-given gifts that he's given you through his spirit in order that you may equip and you may train, and you may do the work of the ministry that he's called you to do. So my role is to help you understand that. Now, I see some young people in here, and I see some older people in here. Who is qualified for the work of the ministry? Everyone. If you are in Christ, if you are saved by Jesus, then you are called to do the work of the ministry. Question is, are you equipped? Are you trained for that? Only you can answer that question. But here's some ways that we're going to move forward and help you with that. Already, you can see behind me, we have a worship team. They have signed up to use their gifts and their talents to help us worship together. If you want to join that team, we'd love to have you. In the back, up in the booth, everybody turn around and say, hey booth, hey media team. That's them, all right? Every single week, they sign up to lead out, to serve us well, and to use their gifts and their talents to help us worship. What about you? Is there a gift that you may have? Some of you are like, man, I don't have any gifts, any talents. I know it. Everybody tells me I don't know it. Here's what I want you to understand. We are creating a new team. It's going to be our connections team. And in the connections team, we're going to have four different opportunities for you to serve. Those four opportunities are going to be our guest connections, a section leader, a hospitality and creative leader, and then also our next step leaders. You don't have a clue what those are yet. I'm going to explain in the next few weeks as we kind of go through this process of helping y'all get active in serving the church. Here's what I want you to do today. If you are interested in taking a step of faith and being equipped and trained for the ministry, which is going to happen in here every single week, then here's what I want you to do. On the, on the screen, there should be a slide. It's going to say gsfbc.org forward slash lead. And I want you to go, and I just want you to simply fill out an information card and then select one of the areas that you'd like to serve in. Now, as we move forward, this isn't something that you should feel obligated to do. This is something that you should feel called to do. And if you're nervous right now, here's what Joshua learns before he goes into the promised land. The Lord says, hey, I'm going to give you everything you need. All you need to do is take a step of faith and be courageous. Maybe you are in this room, you have never served or had an opportunity to do that before, and you can't wait. Guess what? We're going to have a training in about three weeks, and I'm going to explain all of these things to you. But what I want you to do today is just to simply pray and to ask Hey, where can God use me? And then if God has a plan for me, we have a spot for you. That's what I want you to understand today is that we need you, we want you, and it's not something I want from you. It's something that we as a staff, we want for you to equip you to do the work of the ministry. And so I'm going to get off my soapbox now, and I'm going to kind of bring us back into where we're at now. Today is an opportunity for us to connect with God through his word and through worship. And the next song that we're going to go into is called Do It Again. This is a song that's so powerful. 
It's so uh, great when we remember the promises that God has made, but then also the faithfulness that he has in his promises. He never wavers. He's never untrue. He's always good, and he's always good on his promises. And so wherever you're at today, I don't know what you're walking through. I don't know what you're going through right now, but the Lord does. And his word is true. And as we lean into that, remember that his word is true and his promises are true. He will do it again. Amen. So let's pray together and then we're going to join back into worship. God, we thank you so much just for this opportunity to come here today. And as we're here, as we're in your place of worship, God, we pray that your spirit would move us. It would guide us. It would convict us. It would encourage us. It would spur us on to the work that you're calling us to do. God, I pray against anything that would hinder us from doing what you've called us to do. That is a work of the enemy. That is not from you. And so, God, if there's fear in the room, if there's anxiety in the room, if there's depression in the room, God, move it out. Because your promises are true and your word remains true today. Jesus, thank you that you would lead us well. That even now, that as you are the head of the church, you are serving us well. And we pray, Spirit, again, that you would move us today. And we do this in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Just as Adam said, we're going to sing this song. I just encourage you even just to maybe think of a moment in your life, a situation in your life right now that you just need to sing these words into this morning and believe. And uh, let's worship the Lord together. Oh, 
still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me yet. Let's sing this together. And I surrender all. And I surrender. This morning we sing to him. Oh, I surrender all. I surrender all. And all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Can we bow our heads this morning? Can we just lift that up one more time, just from our hearts? I surrender all. I surrender all. And all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. God, we thank You. It's because of your work, what you have done, that we have the opportunity to surrender. Lord, we thank you for sending your son. We thank you for the perfect life that he lived, the example that he gave us, what it looks like to truly surrender, to truly give our lives to you. Lord, we know that you when you created the world, when you created Adam and Eve, God, the perfection, God, that sin has distorted that. And Lord, today we just, we long for your presence. Lord, as we sing that, as we sing, Lord, our surrender to you, God, it's because we long for a perfect relationship with our creator. So God, we thank you this morning for Christ. We thank you for the redemption that we can have through him. And Lord, we pray that you would continue to transform our hearts, continue to draw us closer to you. Lord, so that we can serve you, so that we can love you, and we can truly know what it means to follow you. So Lord, we thank you for this time of worship this morning. We pray that as God's word is open, that it would just speak into the deepest parts of our heart this morning. Or that you would challenge us and change us. So Lord, we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus and for your glory. Amen. You guys can be seated. Well, good morning, those of you here in the house, those in the venue, those of you online. This morning, we continue our study in the book of Genesis. I hope you're getting a sense of how foundational an understanding of Genesis and of the uh, creation account is for your faith and your confidence in the Word of God. You know, too many Christians aren't sure what they believe about evolution versus creation or a uh, new world and, and old earth. Really, what they aren't sure about is that they believe the veracity of God's Word. Satan has really done a number through the advancement of secular humanism to confuse believers and cast doubt on the Word of God. And he uses today the same old lie he used that we'll get to next week in Genesis 3, the same old lie that he used with Eve, did God really say? And the primary reason for the attack on the Word of God and the denial of Genesis specifically is that when you acknowledge that there's a creator, you become accountable to him. He made you, 
He owns you. He certainly, as the, as the creator, has the right to tell you what to do and how to live your life. And, and people don't want that. They don't want someone telling them how to live their life. You know, the wonderful, wonderful thing for us as believers is we have figured out God's infinite love for us. We figured out that his plan for our lives is perfect. And, and when we obey God, it brings purpose and fulfillment we would never find apart from his plan. You know, the pleasures of sin, Scripture says, last only for a season. The mercies of God are new every morning. And it's in his plan for us that we find the purpose and fulfillment. Now, we need, obviously, as believers, we need to know God's word. It's, it's the only uh, source of truth. It's not unproven. It's not unfounded theory. You and I need to be firmly grounded in the truth. All the answers we need, all the directions we need are found in this book, in, in God's word. As you're turning to chapter 2 this morning, let's uh, just quickly review. Last week, we looked at days 4 through 6 of creation. Day 4, the sun, moon, and stars. Uh, Day 5, the uh, aquatic life and the birds. And then day 6, the land creatures, including man. And remember that we saw that all the living things God made on day 5 and 6 were made according to their kinds. Within their DNA, of course, there's variation within a kind or within a species, but one kind will not evolve to another kind. One of the illustrations I used last week in the venue was uh, there are 195 known breeds of dogs, of canines, 195 known breeds. But a canine will never become a feline. One uh, kind does not evolve into another kind, according to God's design. One of the word from last week before we move on to chapter two, you know, there are so many fascinating elements in creation. I could hang out in chapter one for a long time. And one of my, one of my favorite elements is day four where it says God made the greater light and the lesser light and the stars and the stars, almost as an afterthought. We have the greater light, we have the lesser light. Oh, and he also made the stars. In our universe, it's estimated there are one septillion stars. That's one intended the 24th power, one with 24 zeros behind it. And in the 147th Psalm, the psalmist tells us that God only, not, not only created these stars, God gave each star its name. And he shares that as a word of encouragement. The 147th Psalm is entitled, A Psalm for the Brokenhearted. And in the 147th Psalm, the psalmist is calling on the congregation to praise God for his benefits, to recognize his greatness in sustaining creation, and to recognize his grace in healing those who are afflicted. Well, what does the creation of one septillion stars have to do with encouraging the brokenhearted? I I like playing with numbers. I hope you heard what I said. I like playing with numbers. And so I got thinking this week about that one septillion stars. I thought, okay, there are about 7.8 billion people on planet Earth right now. And so I took 7.8 billion and I divided that into one septillion. And what I discovered is, is you divided the number of stars we know about by the number of people on Earth, each and every individual person could have 128 trillion stars. All for you. 128 trillion stars that God made for you. Well, what if God assigned 128 trillion stars to each of us? Think about the fact that God knows your 128 trillion stars by name. Knowing that, don't you think he knows everything about you and every intricate detail of your life? You know, when, we're, when you're struggling, when you're discouraged, when you're afflicted, maybe, maybe your prayer to God should be influenced by that thought. God, I, I, I know you know where I am and you know what I'm going through. I know you know my name and you know all about me. You know exactly where I am right now. God, I take comfort in the fact that as a creator of one septillion stars, as creator of the 128 million star, t- trillion stars that could be mine, God, you know my name and you know my need. Creation speaks to the omniscience and the omnipotence and the sovereignty and love of our God. Maybe we should spend some time there, especially when we're struggling. Well, chapter 2, look at verses 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Those verses are actually wrapping up through the conclusion of chapter one. It says that God stopped his work and he rested. Well, why did God need to rest? 
God doesn't get tired. He wasn't physically resting. The work wasn't overwhelming. Remember, the work for God in creation was simply that he spoke all of creation into existence. He rested simply means he came to an end of his work of creation. He came to an end. He was satisfied with what he had created. It it was finished. He rested. It's like a defense attorney saying that he rests his case. Everything that needed to be spoken, needed to be done, has been spoken, has been done. It's complete. So God rested on the seventh day, and it says he blessed the seventh day and made it holy. What, What does that mean? Well, God elevated the seventh day and made it special and unique. It was special and unique because creation was complete. The work was perfect, and God was satisfied with the work that had been done. And so the the purpose for the seventh day or for the Sabbath was to serve as a memorial, a reminder of the perfect creation and the glory of God's perfect creation. Now, what about the rest part for us? You know, the physical rest was prescribed in the Ten Commandments when they were given. And the purpose of the Sabbath rest, it was part of the moral law. It was a sign and and, and a symbol to God's people that they had forfeited paradise. That God had created this perfect world and perfect order, but but they had forfeited that due to sin. And so the purpose of the rest was to lead the people to rest spiritually and to lead the people to to reflect and to lead the people to repentance. Now, I don't want to make a big deal out of this. I wish I had known this when I was a child. Um, My mom's understanding of Sabbath and rest was that we did nothing on Sunday. Our home, um, we had this huge uh, picture window in our living area. Our home uh, faced a field across the street where all the kids in the neighborhood played all weekend. Not me on Sunday. You know, even when I got older, I guess my mom thought I was a little foolish. Maybe I was. She would say, well, you need to go lay down. You don't have to take a nap, but you need to go lay down and be still. Do you know that of the Ten Commandments, this one about the rest on the Sabbath, it's the only one not repeated in the New Testament? It's not in there. Why? Well, because when Jesus came, things changed. He, cha- he, he ended all the legalities of, of Judaism and the rituals and the feasts and the ceremonies. In fact, you know, Jesus said, I wish I had known this verse to say this to my mom. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It all changed. Yes, rest and reflection are are good. What do we see in the New Testament? We see that we're to be a holy people. We see that we are to assemble. We see that we're to worship in spirit and in truth. Christians don't observe the Sabbath anyway, do we? Sabbath is the last day of week. Saturday, we reflect on the first day of the week. It's a day we have set aside to honor the Lord and to remember what Christ has done for us because he was raised, the resurrection occurred on the first first day of the week. Saturday, the seventh day, was a memorial to creation. Sunday, the, the first day, is a witness that God is Redeemer. And that's what we celebrate, and that's why we gather on Sunday, on the Lord's Day, on the first day of the week. Well, before we jump into verse 4, let me mention that that there are those, and you may encounter some folks like this, who feel that Scripture has some inaccuracies in it. And they would point out to you that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are two different accounts of creation, and they contradict each other. Well, here's the reality. Genesis 1 is an overview of the creation of the universe and of all the living things of all of life. It's a chronological overview or order. We're told what happened on each day ending in day 6. Genesis 2 is an elaboration on a theme. It's a more in-depth explanation uh, or focus on the creation of man and woman. You see in Genesis 2 the details of how God made Adam. You see how he revealed Adam's need for a mate. You see how he made Eve. He instituted marriage. And you see the instructions that they were given. That's what we find in Genesis 2. So let's jump in in verse 4. It says, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now, the Hebrew word translated here, generations, carries the meaning of, of an account. In other words, this is the account of the heavens and earth when they were created and and in the day that God made uh, the heavens and the earth. Now, before we get into the specifics of the creation of Adam, look at verses 5 and 6. I don't know if you happen to read ahead this week. If you did, this may have tripped you up. Uh, It can be very confusing. Uh, This is one of the areas where people who say chapter 2 contradicts chapter 1, this is one of the areas they will likely point to. Look what it says in 5 and 6. 
when no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, there was no man to work the ground, a mist was coming up from the land and was watering the whole face of the earth. And then verse 7 says, that is when God formed man. Now, when you read that at first glance, it seems to read that God had not yet created the plant life when he made Adam. But we know back in chapter 1 that the vegetation was created on day 3 and man was created on day 6. Now, I don't want to get bogged down here, but I do think this needs explanation. I'll admit these verses have confused me before. I'm not a, I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I know one, actually more than one. Uh, I know how to dig, I know how to read, and I do recognize the differences in some Hebrew words. When my scholar's not available, I have some tools that I can use. But the account here in verses 5 and 6 is not going back to day 3. It's really explaining something completely different. It's actually describing the earth after the first five days, but before the fall. How's that evident? Well, when you examine the Hebrew wording... Here in verse 5, the word for bush is not the same word used in Genesis 1. Evidently, this is a, a different kind of plant that we're introduced to in Genesis 1. you also notice here in 5 and 6, look at it. We're told the reason the bush of the field and the small plant had not sprung up yet was that God had not caused rain and there was no man to till the ground. Verse 6 tells us there was no rain because at this time, at the time of creation, water was coming up out of the ground to water the earth. Now, let me jump ahead a little bit. I don't want to lose you here. Let me jump a little bit ahead in Genesis history to bring this all together. Next week, we're going to look at the fall, but let's go ahead, look over in chapter 3. should be right there across the page or on the next page. Let's look at verses 17 through 19 of chapter 3. <clears throat> this is after Adam and Eve have eaten from the tree. God has confronted them. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now look back to verses 5 and 6 of chapter 2. Understand that it was after the fall, you saw the curse here we read in chapter 3, after the fall the ground would produce thorns and thistles. Those weren't a part of a perfect creation. Those weren't in the garden. Recognize also that after the fall, Adam was going to have to till or work the ground and plant crops if he was going to eat the plants of the field. So understanding that, then we see here the bush of the field and the small plants of the field must be referring to plant life other than what God created on day three. It was plant life that came after the fall, thorns and thistles and crops that Adam had to plant and till and work the ground. And those underground springs were how the earth was watered. You understand that rain did not occur until after the fall. In fact, it occurred long after the fall. We won't get to the rain until we get to the flood account in Genesis 6, 7, and 8. Rain was actually a judgment. It's what God used to destroy the earth. So all that happened after the fall. Now, if I've completely lost you, and I've kind of completely lost myself going through all this, but if I've completely lost you, let me just word summarize verse 5 and 6 this way. After all that God had created in the perfect world that he made, and before the earth was corrupted by sin, before man had to work hard for food and deal with weeds and thorns and thistles, verse 7, here's the account of how God made man. So that helps you understand that 5 and 6 are not controversial, controversial to the Genesis account of God's creation of the plant life. All right, let's, let's jump in verse 7. Now, you're going to see, unlike all the living creatures, you have to remember back to last week, unlike all the living creatures which God simply spoke into existence, the creation of man was much more hands-on. God didn't just speak man into existence. Look at verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground... And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. I want you to notice there's certainly no evolution here. There were no uh, pre-human ancestors, not even an ape. 
God didn't create some kind of animal and then watch man evolve from that. He didn't use evolution to, create, to, to bring man into being. It says here, God made man from the dust of the ground. Who created the dust of the ground? God did. So from the matter made by God, God made man. I want you to think about it for just a minute of how hands-on this describes the creation of man. It's astounding to think that the creator, whose power was so great that he could just speak things into being with his word, it's astounding to think that he would stoop down and get his hands dirty to form man. Does that say something about your value to our Lord? He is still, ever since day one, he is still painstakingly involved in the creation of life. Listen to Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14. As David testifies to the, the God who made him, he says, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. How many of you ladies in this room knit? Raise your hand real high so I can see you. If you knit, I don't see many. You probably don't have time. You ever watch somebody knit? That's a painstaking process, isn't it? Pearl one, drop two, I don't, what, what, how's that go? Somebody help me out. Pearl's in there somewhere, isn't it? Yeah, okay, thank you. I don't, I don't knit, I just have heard that said. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I think sometimes we have this concept that when God, when, 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 when a baby is formed, God just kind of calls up some warehouse in heaven and sends a torso and a head and arms and legs and all just thrown together. No, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. It's still not a random process. So much God thinks of you and of, and of me. Verse 7 says, he formed man, and then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. We didn't see that with the animals. They have the breath of life, clearly, but it says God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. All, all creatures, all living creatures have the breath of life. You'll see that and when we get to chapter 7, when it says uh, that the flood uh, decimated or destroyed everything that had the breath of life in it, but only into man did God breathe the breath of life. What is he doing? He's breathing his image into man. Genesis 1:27. we are made in the image of God. All living creatures have a soul, but only man has a spirit that enables us to connect with the spirit of God. That's how we have relationship with God. We don't know the location of Eden today. We just know that it was in the east. That's what the word tells us. It was a garden filled with lush plants, with beautiful stones, with minerals, with gold. Look at verse 9. Verse 9 tells us that the trees God planted in the garden were pleasant to sight and good for food. I don't know that the garden had everything, every plant that God made in the creation account. It was a very special place, and God put the best of the best there. And of course, you know the two trees that are uh, mentioned are the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And before we get to the, in, the instruction regarding these trees, look quickly at verse 15. It says that God placed man, he took him and he gave him, put him in the Garden of Eden to do what? To work it and to keep it. Listen, God made man to work. That's in us, that's innate. It's, it's not part of the curse. God made man to work. Work existed before sin. Now, the work wasn't stressful. It was, it was fulfilling. And, and before the fall and before the curse, Adam, the keeper of the garden, wouldn't have to deal with weeds and thorns and thistles. The, the ground wasn't cursed, so plants would grow in perfect conditions. Work was what God made Adam, what God made man for. Now look at verses 16 and 17. This kind of 
sets the stage for our study next week. The two trees mentioned in verse 9 were a test of man's submission and obedience to the Creator. Tree of Life had the supernatural ability to sustain life. It was in the middle of the garden. It was in a prominent spot. But also there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let me tell you, that tree was not toxic. That tree didn't have poisonous fruit. The tree in and of itself was not harmful. But eating from it would give man the knowledge of good and evil. At this point, Adam and then later Eve only knew good. And so God tells Adam not to eat of it, and he warns him. He tells him, if you, if you eat of it, you'll learn evil and you'll die. Now, honestly, shouldn't it be enough that God just said don't? But he even gave reason. I know a lot of times as a parent, I felt like me just saying don't do that should have been enough. God doesn't just say don't eat of it, but he gives reason. He says, look, this act of, of disobedience, eating from this tree would be evil, and I'm going to judge disobedience, or I'm going to judge evil. And, and think about it. All the trees and plants that God had given them in the garden, there was only one restriction. Only this one tree. Adam had no reason to be disloyal to God. He had no reason to disobey. He had no reason to, to doubt God's word or his love. He had no reason to resent the creator. And yet all those things came into play when temptation came. And they do for us as well. Well, let me summarize verses 18 through 20. Uh, in 18 through 20, it says that God brought the animals for Adam to name. You know, we all, I guess, think of different people we want to see when we get to heaven or different questions we have of God or some of the apostles or others. I got a question for Adam. Where in the world did aardvark come from? <laughs> uh, how did you dream that up? He brought the animals for Adam to name. Now, one of the purposes for Adam to name the animals, as you read the text, was for Adam to see. God had already said it was not good for him to be alone. God wanted Adam to see that he was alone. It was not another one of his kind. God had made of all the kinds he had made, male and female, but Adam had no mate. There was nothing compatible. There was no counterpart for Adam. So look at verses 21 and 22 that tell us how God fashioned Adam's mate. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. Hey, I want to ask you to raise your hands, but how many of you men ever counted to make sure you had all your ribs? <laughs> We're not short one, okay? He took one of his ribs, closed up the place with flesh, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. So God took bone and flesh and blood from Adam and, and made. The word made there literally means to build. It's not, it's not a quick, easy process. It's, it's very hands-on, a very loving process. He took bone and flesh and blood from Adam and he built this woman. And she was also made in the image of God. We go back to Genesis 126 and see that. Let us make man in our image, male and female, he made them. She's made in the image of God. She's not lesser. She's not intellectually, morally, or spiritually deficient. She, she is equal. Well, why was she created differently from man? This is not how God made man. The way he made, the way he made woman, Eve, was completely different. It's an illustration. Her role is to come under the leadership and protection and care of the man. What do your ribs do? Why do you have ribs? They protect. All those internal organs, they're there to, to protect. God created Eve from the rib of Adam to show that she's under his protection, his care, his leadership. Verse 20, there wasn't a helper fit for him. What does that mean? It means there wasn't a helper that was corresponding to him or, or worthy of him. God made woman to be worthy being a helper, a helper who was fit would enable Adam to fulfill the mandate God gave to fill and subdue the earth. 
to reproduce, to rule. Verse 23, then the man said, <clears throat> this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. At last, I haven't seen this before and all these other living creatures the Lord has brought before me. At last, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, I don't know about your translation, but if you look, most translations, you see that verse 23 is, is set apart, typically by indention. The reason for that is the language here ha has changed. It's recognized as poetic language. Adam either wrote a poem or perhaps this was the first love song that's ever been written. He's so overwhelmed when God brings this woman to him that he launches into poetry. And men, there you have the reason every wife would love her husband to write a sonnet to her sweetness. But you've got eight days. Verses 24 and 25, God institutes marriage. A man and a woman come together for life, not, not for a temporary time, not for a time, but they come together for life. A man and a woman who can create offspring, again, uh, obeying that Genesis 128 uh, command to fulfill the earth and subdue it. A man and a woman who are designed to be one. Now, what I just read to you, looked at you there, looked with you at verse 24 and 25 is just more hate speech in our day. You understand that? Last week in, in Genesis 127, where it says that God created him male and female, the fact that one kind can't change into another kind, that, that's hate speech in our day. And, and so is this. God intended for a male and a female to be united, not a male and a male, not a female and a female, but for a male and a female to be united. That, that's hate speech. There are some who would try to convince you or trick you by saying, well, um, the New Testament doesn't say that. That was Old Testament. That was old law. The New Testament, it's all about love and grace. You know that in, in the book of Matthew in chapter 19, verses 4 through 6, Jesus affirmed these very two principles. He said that God made them male and female, and he said the man was to leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. He declared the same thing. Listen, if God's word is true, and it is, then we have the same choice Adam did. We can choose to obey and be blessed, or we can choose to disobey and be cursed. God's word is true. It's eternal, and it's unchanging, and we do not have the option of rewriting it. What does that mean for us as a church? Well, as a church, we stand on the truth, but we operate in love. Listen, Jesus didn't hate sinners, neither do we. But Jesus confronted sin. Why did he confront sin? Out of his love for sinners. He was calling them to repentance and calling them to life, calling them out of the curse and calling them into blessing. And that's what we do as well as the body of Christ. And it's incredible to read of God's account of creation and see the, the power and the and the, um, just the omniscience and omnipotence and sovereignty of God, and then to recognize his incredible love for us in how he created and how he intended life to be lived. And we don't want to miss that, and we don't want anyone we know to miss that as well. Would you bow with me this morning? Amen. Let's do that this morning. Let's just bow as Pastor Dave asked us to this morning, and just pray um, and give God thanks for his word this morning. And uh, we just want to encourage you guys uh, during this time of response to respond as God calls you to respond. And we're going to have some pastors on the sides over here uh, during this time. So if, if the Lord is leading uh, in your heart um, and uh, is moving you uh, to, to, from his word, uh, we ask that you would respond this morning in that. Um, and we're going to sing together. Uh, just as, as Dave said, that we believe in God's word, that we believe in the truth that he has given us.
day of worship. Before we leave, just want to mention two things. One, tonight we have prayer service at 5.30. We're going to go back to our roots a little bit, that we've been created a little differently. And so we're going to invite our men to pray in Sanders Hall, and our women will pray here in the venue. It's going to be a unique time, and I challenge you to be a part of that. At the end of that time, we're going to have a church-wide fellowship down in Sanders Hall. Some of you may not know that I spent five years as a middle school pastor, best years of my life. That's where I got bald and gray all in five years. But we're really excited about how we desire to engage in discipleship among all ages. And so this coming weekend, we have a middle school retreat called Big Chill. And uh, so in the moments we have left in worship, we're going to put our eyes and our hearts and our heads towards this weekend, hear a little about it, and then pray together. So Casey, tell us a little about this weekend. What is this weekend all about? For sure. So we have 6th uh, through 8th grade, which is unique to our ministry because we run 7th through 12th. And so it is the first time for 6th graders to get to come up with us. Uh, and so it is a weekend retreat where uh, they will come Friday evening. They'll stay in host homes. Uh, and then we will come back Saturday 
uh, stay throughout the day Saturday. Uh, we have teaching. Uh, we have worship time sessions. Here's the coolest part. We have 48 students uh, who are attending 6th through 8th grade, but we have right at 40 students uh, ninth through 12th grade who are leading this. And so this is not led out by adults. Uh, we are facilitators, uh, and we're like kind of the, hey, don't do that. Uh, but we have our own students who are leading small groups uh, who are setting things up, making all this work. And so it is a really unique opportunity, uh, and it's just special to watch God work through our older students uh, and then just encourage our younger students. What an incredible uh, gift for our older students to invest in our younger students. So I want you to be very thoughtful about that. So I've asked Tara to kind of help us understand how we can pray and then lead us in prayer in the moments we have left. Tara? Yeah, so we're going to pray together. I'm going to lead you in a guided time of prayer, and then everybody will be dismissed. So let's pray. Um, just take a few minutes um, just to pray for the hearts of students to hear from God's word. Now take a few moments just to pray for our student leaders that they'll lead out well um, and that they will just lead the younger students closer to the Lord. Next, I want to ask if you'll take a few seconds just to pray um, that our students will accept the challenge just to stand up and stand out for Christ um, and not just try to fit in um, with the world, um, but that they would just be bold and take a stand for what Christ asked them to. And then lastly, I ask that you just pray for safety and for the adults that will be here, that they would make lasting relationships with students as well. Father, I just want to ask you, Lord, um, just for your blessing on this weekend, God, um, for all the effort that has gone into planning this weekend, God, Lord, it means nothing if you don't show up. Lord, I pray that your spirit would just um, be present with our students, God, that you would speak through our high school students into our middle schoolers' lives, Lord, and that um, this weekend would just be a good, fresh start, Lord, just for them um, to renew commitments to you, Lord, um, and that they... Um, would just remember, God, that they were not meant to fit in, God, that they were born to stand out if they are your child, Lord, that um, we're called to be different and we're called to be lights in this world. And Lord, I pray that this weekend um, would just draw each student closer to you, Lord. I pray that both high schoolers and middle schoolers, Lord, would just be challenged through the messages this weekend. God, I pray that um, kids would just draw closer to you in worship I and mean, through teaching and through leading, Lord. I pray that um, you would just help those who are serving to know, um, God, that they're investing in kingdom work, Lord, and that um, I pray, Lord, that you would just move in mighty ways this weekend, Lord, in ways that we could, greater than we can ever ask or imagine, Lord. Um, and I pray that you would be glorified um, and that we would bring glory to your name this weekend. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. All right. Love you guys. Y'all are dismissed. Hey, thank you for joining us today for worship. My name is Matt Sullivan. I'm the Young Adults Associate Pastor and the Director of Recovery Ministries. We want to connect with you. If you're new to Geyer Springs, if you can pull out your cell phone and text DISCOVER to 94000. Or if you're a regular attender, if you can text GSFBC to 94000, we would appreciate that. Geyer Springs exists to glorify God by making disciples who love God and love others. One of the ways we do that is through our recovery ministry, Breaking the Chains, which meets every Thursday night at 6 p.m. If you or a loved one are struggling with drugs or alcohol and you want to get help, this is your opportunity. You can reach out to me directly on my cell phone anonymously and discreetly. You can call or text. My number is 501-472-1356. I would love to meet you and talk with you. 
Hey, thanks for joining us today. Have a great week. We look forward to seeing you next week.